Thank you, ma'am. I think I need to cut down my seat because it's going to be longer than my presentation. Uh, uh, well, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The topic that I've selected today is all about how the mines and tools going to work and how we're going to address challenges in the littorals in the future. This study was basically uh, based on US Navy and the advanced navies in the world. So I will basically stick on to the main theme and subsequently touch upon the sub-theme at the latter part of the presentation. Uh, this is my game plan for today. I'll try to uh, walk through these areas. Uh, we all know maritime threats and challenges continue to evolve at a very rapid pace. And decision making in the maritime domain is comparatively challenging than when you compare the other two domains for obvious reasons. Tactics, sensors and platforms have evolved over the years. If you take the first recorded naval battle and all the way to Falklands and thereafter. Uh, we also see ma uh, maritime conflicts gradually shifting from open seas towards the littorals and also maritime environment moving from a complex one and it has become a complicated one today. So in this outset, decision making going to be a real challenge for the real operators uh, uh, fighting in the littorals. Uh, well, conventional navies unfortunately are vulnerable against an unorthodox enemy. Uh, we see, especially in the US Navy, a lot of highly autonomous uh, vessels being introduced, unmanned surface vessels coming to play like Sea Hunt and uh, Littoral Combat Ship, but do they, can they really do anything in the future warfare? That's, that's a big question that we have. Now, we have on one side the conventional thinker, and on the other side you have the unconventional competitor. How best are we going to fight against an unconventional a competitor with a conventional mindset? And uh, we also see conventional navies tend to focus on near-peer competitors rather than looking at asymmetric threats. So advanced navies are at this one advantage despite being technologically superior. So that's one important observation that we see. Just to give you a glimpse of what these uh, new technologies look at, this is the littoral combat uh, ship used by the US Navy. It's a manned one. And these are unmanned small vessels that are used to basically do swarming attacks and fight in the littorals. I have my senior officers here, I think they will, they will definitely question that how best this thing can really come into combat against a uh, you know, human driven uh, craft on the other side. That's a big that question that's been raised uh, in the US as well. So I would like to walk you through time, space and force dynamics very briefly in order to understand why this is a challenge. So if you look at uh, 1916 or World War I or World War II, this is Battle of Jutland map. You see the space, it's enormous, the naval platforms, naval fleets have the luxury of maneuvering on a bigger area. But look what has happened today. If you look at the strategic chalk points in the world, they are narrower in terms of space. So you don't have the luxury that you had uh, many decades ago to maneuver your fleets the way you want. Same applies to the force as well. Uh, during World War One and Two, navies had the luxury of concentrating large number of assets whenever they want. But imagine a, a scenario taking place in Malacca Strait. Even though you have number of assets with you, I really don't think you can mass or concentrate all of them to fight in a very confined uh, sea space. So what happens when space and force shrink? That's going to have a real impact on the time component. Time is very critical in making decisions and you make decisions against time. So basically you compete with time. So time factor is going to shrink further. So that's a uh, dynamics that you need to, we need to understand if we are going to really address the threats in the littoral uh, warfare. Just to give you a different uh, uh, kind of a different perspective on this uh, as well, in tanker wars, Iraqi uh, fighter jet launch a, uh, launched a, a missile at 200 nautical miles. They did the uh, object, but unfortunately they couldn't do anything. It was hit, and 35 sailors lost their life. Then you see a U.S. Navy firing at an Iranian passenger vessel, uh, passenger flight, uh, rather, and you know basically downing it. And we also see the inability of naval forces to keep uh, in pace with the advanced weaponry that are taking place in the world today. You can see hypersonic uh, you know, missiles going at even at 8 max. That's an that's a enormous speed to make decisions. So that's, that's a key challenge that we have. So why I bought these uh, examples to showcase you is even if you have one of the most advanced weaponry today, in the littorals, you will not have the depth and the distance that you want to launch them. Because you're going to fight in a confined space, you will have smaller vessels, you don't have the luxury of identifying them as bigger vessels. They will be mingled with fishing, fishing, fishing vessels and merchant vessels for sure. So you will not have that luxury even though you have technology in your hand. And we also see, you know, enemy 
looking at you very uh, seriously and he will take advantage of this. And another major observation what we see here is the tactical level going to play a crucial role in the littoral conflicts in the future. Strategic and operational level will be disconnected for obvious reasons because the tactical level will not have the time to go back to the strategic command or the operational command to take decisions. He will have to make his decisions on his own. Uh, we also see a tendency to leave aside human element from decision making and heavy reliance on uh, basically smart tools or the smart brains that we have. Uh, let, me, let me touch upon very briefly on some of the decision making instruments and the limitations that uh, we encounter common to our, ours as, uh, or the other navies as well. Uh, there are a number of instruments. If you take uh, your uh, rule of engagement, standing operating procedures, your estimates, they all help you to develop a logical sequencing in order to make a decision. But I strongly believe formats confine you. They restrict you. They take away your initiativeness, they take away your independence, they take away your aggressiveness. In the US, they have a very serious policy called the zero error tolerance policy. You're not supposed to make a mistake, you'll be kicked out. And that, made, that has made most of the officers risk averse. You, have, you don't have creativity anymore. And very seriously, you need the warrior spirit. That's something very crucial in fighting the shoulder force in the future. There are three gentlemen here, very famous, for all of the naval officers, especially uh, Admiral Chester Nimitz, when he was a sub-lieutenant. He ran around his ship. He was court-martialed and he was reprimanded, but he was never kicked out of the Navy. He played a crucial role in the Pacific ocean during World War II. He's the basically turning point of the Battle of Midway. So if this happened today in the US Navy, you will have no chance. Uh, so operators today, what they have done is they basically you know, become enslaved to technology. It's easy to blame the technology than take the responsibility on you. So there's a huge argument. How can we inculcate the aggressiveness, aggressive environment to machines? Can we do that to machines? Or it is something that we have in as humans, the aggressive? So this is where uh, the concept of littoral aggressive warrior concept comes into play. How are you going to face an uh, aggressive enemy? Obviously, you need to be you know, proactive and you have to have an aggressive mindset. Uh, risk taking is crucial in this regard. So we have this argument yesterday of you know, high tech and low tech. How are we going to balance? Because the navies are advanced navies are high tech, but your threat is low tech. So how, how are we going to uh, address these? So I see embracing a uh, littoral aggressive warrior culture could bring easily unparalleled results. Uh, Sri Lanka Navy remains as the best example I could cite here very easily. Uh, so you need to have a technology, you need to have the uh, smart brains and uh, inject a littoral aggressive warrior mentality, it will be a force multiplier. Uh, interestingly, some of the US document, uh, strategy documents speaks about this thing, but unfortunately you see a strategy and policy mismatch. This is the area that we am going to, you know, briefly touch upon the policy area. So this is the strategy policy outline the U.S. follows, as uh, many of you know. Uh, you look at ends, ways, and means, and then you develop your national security strategy, then forming the defense strategy, then comes your military strategy. The below one is the Chinese defense white paper. So we need to see how best our strategy is going to really play in real scenarios. They, they look very nice, pretty, uh, sharp on paper, but when you're going to really uh, put them into action, you're going to have challenges. These are some of the you know, obvious arguments that are taking place in the US now. Uh, is the US Navy ready for a war with China, with Iran? Is it you know, equally capable of you know, uh, uh, fighting with China? And then the littoral combat ship, which I showed you, have been critically, basically criticized as a complete failure. So can, can she bring results in a littoral uh, combat scenario? And then also US Navy's Arctic strategy has been highly uh, criticized because it doesn't have the depth that it needs to bring in. And also uh, the Sumwar class uh, state-of-the-art destroyer has been criticized because they don't know what to do with this vessel now. They were intended to you know, make a major impact but it seems like they have troubles these days. Uh, well, I come to my conclusion, I couldn't find a better saying than this and I quote late Steve Jobs. Uh, it's not a faith in technology, it's faith in people, and I am hope. Thank you very much.